there are four key ingredients to living well in the new retirement, health, family, purpose, and finance. And here to discuss that with me is Ken Dykewald of AgeWave and author of a just published study on the topic. Ken, welcome. Good to be with you. Hope you're all, hope you and your family are well. Uh, we are, and I hope the same for you and yours. Thank you. So Ken, um, I'm eager to hear what you believe are the most key profound findings that you discovered in this landmark study, really. Thank you. Um, you know, there were, there were a number of them. Uh, sometimes when we look at studies or we've done studies over the decades, you get one interesting headline or one interesting insight. And there were a bundle of them here, which, which was sort of uh, fantastic in a lot of ways. So let me mention a few. Um, first, when we ask people how you uh, thought of retirement, was it kind of a time to chill out and relax? Was it winding down? Turns out most people said it's a whole new chapter in life. Now, when my grandparents were turning 65 or so, they were not viewing themselves as being at the beginning of a whole new chapter in life. They really thought they had reached sort of the bottom of the ninth inning and it was time to put their affairs in order. So here, partly because of longevity and partly because of this kind of ever reinventing themselves nature of the boomer generation, this space, this territory, this lifescape we call retirement is now being viewed as 20 to 30 years, time for new beginnings, fall in love again if you're divorced or widowed, maybe start a new career, maybe reinvent yourself with hobbies, maybe find out who you really are. So that was a big one. Another one was that uh, there is a sort of a framework emerging, that when we think of the future of retirement, often people think about, well, how much money do you need? or best places to live. You know, that's what the magazine universe focuses on. But what we learned was that people feel that there are four major ingredients and, and they're intertwined. Health, family, purpose, which has really never been looked at, been talked about, but never been examined in a deep study like this, and finances. And you can't really separate one from the other if you're key relationships are with your kids and your parents, and you're also helping to support them, or you're caregiving your mom, then your finances and your family are all jumbled up together as they are for almost all of us. What was another big uh, takeaway for me? Um, there was sort of a COVID effect. We have been thinking about COVID as being a biologic enemy, and it is. It's a very frightening uh, novel cor coronavirus. And then we occasionally talk about it as having an impact on the economy. But what we learned in our study is that it's also affecting people's mental well-being. And I don't mean necessarily are people you know, becoming bipolar or paranoid schizophrenic. And you know, I am a psychotherapist by training. So I'm not talking about people who are sort of clinically diagnosed, but just mental health as people, how are they doing? And what we found was that older people were more resilient, that they were holding steady better they were more fortified against sort of the pulls and pulls and kind of madness that a lot of people in their 20s and 30s were contending with. I mean, think about it. If you are retired, you're not worried about losing your job. You're probably no longer having kids at home that you're raising. Your mom and dad may no longer be alive, so you're not caregiving them. And thanks to some wonderful safety nets like Social Security and Medicare, you've got a health insurance program and you've got some basic income coming in. There's a lot of young people today during COVID, teens, 20s, 30s, where's my job? What if I can't afford to pay my mortgage, my rent? Uh, my kids are you know, banging against the walls because they wanna go out and play with their friends. Older people turned out to be, be demonstrating kind of an upside of aging. Mm -hmm. And it's that there's more emotional intelligence, there's more personal fortitude, and there's more resilience. Another thing we realized, and let me break it down into each of the elements. People say that, boy, health is so much more important than wealth. And um, they are the disease they're most frightened of, even during COVID, was not COVID. Mm. It's Alzheimer's. People are scared of losing their mind. And they're troubled that so much attention is appropriately being focused on uh, the coronavirus, but not enough on trying to find a cure or a breakthrough drug for Alzheimer's. Also, this was a little bit of an odd one, Bob. Um, most people say that even though you're older, you can improve your health. 
and they even feel that they know what you can do about that. Yet only half the population, by the way, of all ages, are exercising or eating healthy. Hmm. So there's sort of an intention action gap. Yeah. And I think people like to blame the government or their insurer on, on if they have a health challenge. But what we saw in the study was that there's a lot more self-responsibility that can be exercised with regard to health. Do you want me to go on to the other? Yeah, area? well, I'm, I'm curious about that point, knowing that they're concerned about their health, but that so few or just half do something about it. Um, any, any actionable advice for the folks who aren't doing something about it from your perspective? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of benefits that come from taking a little better care of yourself, whether it's walking a half an hour a day or doing some yoga or swimming, if you can find a place to swim in these summer months, uh, or making sure you get proper rest and sleep instead of going to sleep all agitated, because what we're learning, whether it's from Alzheimer's research or cardiovascular health or diabetes or arthritis, is that if you can keep your body healthy and toned, and eat a healthy, closer to plant-based diet, and keep down the inflammatory foods, it can not only make you feel better, but you'll actually live healthier longer, and you'll spend far less money on long-term care costs. So it's a trifecta. Uh, and even if you're 61 or 97 today, it's not too late to get going. You know, it's, it's interesting because one of the findings that I, I discovered when I was reading the study was this notion that the greatest financial worry for retirees and pre-retirees is healthcare and long-term care uh, costs and, and not a recession. And uh, it would seem that that would be motivation enough for folks to do something about their health if they're worried about spending a lot on healthcare. Some of it's well within their control. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question, Bob, because you know I'm a big fan. I traveled all over the world. I've been to many, many continents and dozens of countries. and. Uh, I love the American lifestyle and the American mindset. And I like that we have a lot of freedom, but we're not very disciplined, it seems, <laughs> on either managing our money for the long term or our bodies and health for the long term. And so, yeah, you hit a very interesting point. We ask people, what's your biggest financial fear? The economy. Was it inflation? Was it running out of money? Well, those things all stirred people. But the number one financial fear for pre-retirees and retirees is the cost of health and long-term care. Now, then people said, but I can't know if I'm going to have a stroke or how do I know if I'm going to, you know, when I, how long I'm going to live. And there's a lot of excuses we give and they're, they're practical excuses. They hold up. Doesn't matter. We've all got to take fuller responsibility and more active measures to take better care of our health. It's what people say is the most important thing in life is to have your health. And then people say it's their biggest fear to lose their health, but then half of us are not doing anything to, to make it better. Yeah. So another finding that struck me was the notion that 24 million Americans have provided financial support to adult children due to COVID-19 and that retirees um, may be sacrificing their own uh, future security because of this generosity. Yeah, I was taken by that too. I, um, what I read into that was that I think we're, there's a lot of talk about who we are as a people, but what I saw in the study was a huge amount of generosity, particularly to family members, that people don't seem to be willing to turn their backs on their kids or even their brothers and sisters or their moms and dads if they're alive. And they are outlaying money to help the people they love get through this difficult time even if they can't afford to. Now that's a quirky one because one of the issues that came up is that people said more than anything, they don't ever wanna be a burden on their family. So here people are saying, when I get older, I don't wanna be a burden on my family, but I may be being, you know, serving as the family bank and being so generous to my kids, my brother, my sister, their kids, if, I, if they ask, may put people in jeopardy in the years to come. And that's something we're gonna to have to be very concerned about if people are basically spending their future right now on behalf of the people they love. It's right. a reflection of generosity, but it could turn out to bite them back. I've, uh, I've talked to some financial planners about that very topic and some have suggested that 
if you want to help your children, that's fine, but maybe you help them in the form of a loan so that at least you don't put your own retirement security at risk uh, and that you might get paid back at some point if once they get back on their feet as a, as a sort of a middle ground option. I'll add to that, uh, and I know you've written about this, as, as have I. Uh, almost nobody who helps their kids out writes it up as a loan. I mean, but we could put some terms around it. So I'm going to give you this for three months. Or maybe you can't afford that apartment, so you need to take the next 60 days to figure out what you can't afford. Or I'll do this for you, but you need to look me in the eye and promise that if I need help, you're going to be there for me. So it's not exactly like a loan, like you do in some dispassionate way, but the idea of creating some conditions and terms around it, and also exits, endpoints, for a lot of uh, uh, people in my generation now who are helping their kids out or even their grandkids, it's sort of an indeterminate dynamic, you know, is this going to be the way it is forever, or is this just for the next few months. And I think those things are better if they're discussed a little bit so that people don't feel that they're being taken advantage of or the, the young members of our families realize what our limits might be. Mm. So another finding that I found, Ken, that was really interesting, uh, partly because I'm working on uh, creating with some other folks an elder planning uh, course. And it's the notion that COVID-19 has prompted 30 million Americans to have end of life discussions for the first time. And, and uh, if it takes a tragedy like COVID-19 to have that discussion, so be it. But it's one that should be, we should be having all the time instead of in the, in the, in the case of an emergency. Yeah, see, unfortunately, when we put legacy issues and such uh, off to the last minute or avoid them altogether, then they become morbid. You know, it's sort of like, hey, let's talk about the end of my life. Oh, dad, why would you bring that up? You know, do you, is something happening. But if we view it as sort of a normal course of being a responsible and loving and caring person, having discussions with our kids or with our spouse uh, about, look it, there's several parts to it. Number one, if something were to happen to me, this is how I'd like to be cared for in my later years and days. And that's not saying I hope something bad happens, but just to be thoughtful about it. Uh, before my dad passed away, uh, my brother and I flew to Florida to be with him. He wanted to have a serious talk with us about how he wanted his final days to be. And we honored that. And our mom had Alzheimer's and he made my brother and I look him in the eye and promise that we would never let a minute go by without our looking after her and making sure she was secure and comfortable and loved. And we would have done that anyhow. But the fact that our dad took the time to do that and had the courage to do that, he's passed now, but they had 71 years together. And I'd like to feel that I'm going to be as thoughtful uh, in my later years than I'm in now. The, the other thing about it is that um, a lot of people don't know where to start. You know, uh, we live in a culture where kind of end of life is taboo and can't talk about it, it'll bring bad things about. But as you're, as you're suggesting, I think we all need to have it be a part of our annual kind of re-up. You know, when you're getting your health checked, you ought to have your legacy plans checked. And um, whether that has to do with a will. By the way, one of the interesting pieces of the study, we asked people, when you're thinking of what you wanna pass, what you hold to be important to your children or grandchildren, what's most important to you to pass? Money and real estate mattered, but very small piece of the pie. What people said mattered more than anything were their values and their life lessons. And then we ask heirs, you know, if you're going to receive something from your mom or dad, what's most important to receive? And they said, yeah, sure, if there's some money, I could use it. But more important, they wanted to get the values and life lessons too. Yet we don't have a lot of mechanisms by which we share those. I mean, do we sit down with our moms and dads with a tape recorder or a video camera and say, for the next hour, every day this week, I'm going to interview you about the greatest experiences of your life and the lessons you've learned and what you'd like great, 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 great grandchildren in the future who you'll never meet to know about you. What was your nickname in high school? And where do you come out on God and life and death and family? Just deeper questions, because that's what people want to have captured. They don't want to imagine the end of their life without that having been transferred. 
you know, it, well, it's, let me add, let me add another theme from the study. People sure. said their most, uh, uh, most valuable thing in their lives during COVID and maybe always is their family and their relationships. Mm. And particularly driven by younger generations, they didn't describe family the way my parents would have, which are your blood relatives, you know, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. They said it's a family of choice that we're now living in an era where you might have people live across the hall or friends of your parents who you think of as uncles or grandpas. And they're not actually, mm. but that's the way people are now defining family. Two thirds of all Americans say they got even closer with their families during COVID. That, that may be what we call a silver lining that even though COVID has been so terrible and we, I haven't been able to see my son to be with my son for six months because he's hunkered down in New York and we're here in California, but there's more Zooming, there's more letter writing, there's more telling people I love you. Yeah. than there have been before. And that's probably a positive thing that's happened. From it all. I know it's happened in my family too. I've had more Zoom calls with my sisters than I did in the previous 10 years, I think. So really, yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's been one good thing. Let me go and back to this. Way, that's <laughs> profound in a way, because we all before COVID, we become so occupied with texting and emailing and running around and being busy and going here and going there. That during this terrible pandemic, it's like we're all we all got a time out, you know, we're told, go to your room and think about what's important. <laughs> and a lot of what we're coming out with is what's important are people I love, you know, and I want to make that even better. Yeah. Let, let me go back to the legacy issue. It's one that I'm deeply care about is this notion of leaving a lasting, the money's important, but leaving a sense of who you are and what you stood for and what you, what, um, what experiences that you had. I'm, re I'm reminded of two things. I'm curious for your reaction. One is uh, you're probably familiar with the work that Carl Pillamore has done at, um, at Cornell University around aging and the wisdom, the collective wisdom mm -hmm. of our older adults. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, there have been a number of people who are proponents of uh, creating ethical wills as a way to pass down your legacy. Um, any thoughts about the work that Carl's done and, and ethical wills? Yeah, I don't, and this may be new or familiar to your readers and followers. It's familiar to you, I'm sure. So strangely, during the 20th century, we began to think of inheritance as being property and money. But if you go back a few centuries, particularly in the 14th century, in a number of religious traditions, particularly Jewish and Muslim, they had what were two wills. Everybody had, was, one was a material will. It's the things I have. You know, I have this book. I want to give it to you. Yeah. The other is, it's my values. It's my stories. It's my principles. And that was called an ethical will. And you had to make determinations about what you wanted to pass to future generations. Somehow that whole ethical will idea has just gotten lost. And so, yeah, I applaud you for what you're doing. And gentlemen, you mentioned a Cornell and there's more and more people. I get letters and articles every week now from people who are trying to stir up techniques and mechanisms by which people can kind of craft and share their, what you'll call an ethical will. It's called legacy documents or legacy videos. And um, you know, I did that with my grandparents when I was in my 20s. So that was the 1970s. I filmed both my grandparents and let them tell me the stories of their lives. And they're, it's, you know, they're in black and white. They're totally precious. And I did it again with my parents, but I could do it easily with just a handheld phone. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids have not yet done it with my wife or I. Uh, and I kind of maybe should nudge them and get them going with it because, uh, you know, you never know. But yeah, I think it's a really important part of the sort of the passing of connections between generations. And um, I'm a big supporter of that kind of mentality. Yeah. And I think that uh, partly what we've seen even from Edward Jones is that historically financial advisors used to be kind of like stockbrokers mm -hmm. or life insurance salespeople. But increasingly what we're seeing is the desire to be financial advisors and from studies like this, Edward Jones has learned, that's not just dealing with people around their money. It is necessary to involve their thoughts about legacy. It's necessary to realize that individuals are not solo projects that were connected to families and that money doesn't matter other than how it allows you to have a certain life or a certain uh, comfort or a certain security. Mm -hmm. oh, and let me get to that for a second. One of the, the biggest ahas around finances 
was how few people feel really prepared for retirement. It's like, yikes. Um, and COVID has really lifted the sheet off of that because there's a lot of people in their 30s and 40s who ought to be beginning the process of preparing. 20 million Americans so far during COVID has halt, have halted payments into their retirement accounts. Yeah. Yikes. So as we're coping with the now, unless we're also contemplating a future us and funding that future us and letting it compound and grow, um, that could lead to lots of problems downstream. Mm -hmm. But what you also said was that people, when they thought about their biggest financial worry, it's the realization that health and long-term care costs, particularly long-term care costs, could break the bank. And most people haven't really thought about how much do I need? And I, I gotta tell you, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but we have calculated the average retired couple, how much money they're going to need for health and long-term care costs. And I have now asked many finance reporters, do you have any idea what that number is? And every single one of them have said, no. They said, oh, I know the average healthcare cost. Long-term care, that's another thing. Yeah. But it's not another thing. And by the way, the number is $440,000. Yeah. And that is out of pocket. That's not a small amount. That's not you have a few extra bucks you can spend on it. And so the worry people have is justified. But we've got a healthcare and long-term care system that are incomprehensible, that most people don't think they'll need it, or they just want to avoid thinking about it. Yeah. And more and more financial advisors have got to broach the subject. You know, it, Ken, I guess that it, it, it also strikes me that the need for a financial advisor, for a financial life coach is now greater than ever before, in part because, because of what you just said. So many people, I think, either put their head in the sand about this or wait until the last minute to think about it, in which case they have no time to plan for what's to come because they're at the end of their work career, their end of their savings uh, span, et cetera. So the need for a planner is someone who could at least maybe get you to start thinking about these things and maybe start acting on these things far in advance of, you know, hitting age 67 or so. Yeah. We, um, we asked a question in the survey that we asked people when you, first of all, only about 26% of the American public currently have a financial advisor. So a lot of people think, well, it's a do-it-yourself thing. You know, it's like fixing the sink. You know, I'm, I've got a PhD. I've written 17 books. I've won lots of awards. I don't think I could figure my whole financial program out for myself. So having some help to me is very beneficial. The word that people use in our study when we said, do you want a partner? Do you want a planner? Do you want a guide? Do you want a teacher? Guide. Mm. They said, this is not a one-stop you're there. It's like a journey. I need someone who can continue to help me navigate from point to point. And when new things come up, we can rechart the course. And I think that it, it behooves the financial advisory community. And I know Edward Jones is responding to this to become more of that than just guiding people in the moment for a investment or a stock purchase. But I think there's a whole lot of us that might benefit from not thinking we can do this ourselves, but by having a little bit of counsel and coaching and advice from someone you can trust. Well, it's rare that you would go through life without ever going to a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist. So I can't imagine, right, why it should be rare to not go to a planner. I think a lot of people feel, you know, I've actually never talked about this, but I've seen it in our study. I think a lot of people feel embarrassed. Mm. Oh, then someone's going to find out I haven't done so well. It's okay or they'll find out I don't really understand all what a 401k, 403. I'll give you an example. I was looking at this just today, actually. Here's my Medicare bill, okay? Oh, I don't know what it is. It's a document the government sends me every month. On the top left, it says Medicare premium bill. And on the top right, it says, this is not a bill. <laughs> now, I'm not embarrassed to say, I don't understand this. What, what are they talking about? It's so much of the world of finance is not user friendly. You know, yeah. what's a part A? What's a part B? What's a donut hole? What's a, you know, what's an exchange traded fund? I mean, how is everybody supposed to understand all of this? And I think the industry itself has got to get a little more user friendly. And I think more and more of us have got to be willing to say, hey, you guys, make this a little easier to work with. Right, right. 
So Ken, is there um, anything that we haven't touched upon in the study that you think it's worth mentioning or anything that we've touched on that you think you want to reemphasize? Two things. Um, people felt that having a purpose in retirement really mattered. That it wasn't enough to say, I used to be a school teacher, I used to be a boss, I used to be a housekeeper. You got a whole new chapter in life and people realize that finding your new purpose, your new identity is meaningful. But about a third of the population say that they don't even know where to begin. So we don't really have purpose counselors. Maybe it's people in faith or people who are psychologists or life coaches. But we need, a lot of people need some more help kind of refinding themselves in their later years. And I think that's a non-trivial exercise because last year, the average retiree in America watched 48 hours of television a week. Ouch. Now, that's fine if you like a lot of TV, but I'd like to believe that there is more that we could be in our later years. Maybe it's more contributing to our community. Maybe it's helping out in our synagogue or church. Maybe it's going back to school. Maybe it's learning how to play the guitar, whatever it is. But I think that there's a lot of wasted talent with our elders by not having more of us finding purpose. And the last thing I'll say is that during this COVID exercise, we thought we would see huge differences between blue states and red states and people of one ethnic group and minorities. And I tell you what, we didn't find that so much. Well, yeah, there were some women were more nervous, but more caring, you know? People in urban environments were getting more knocked down by COVID than people in more rural environments. But overall, we saw that there was kind of a common heartbeat that whoever you are in America, there's a generosity towards your family. There's a desire to make something good of your life. And there's the hope that your later years cannot be a time of suffering, but rather a time of meaning and relationships. And um, so we came away from the study quite hopeful, actually, about the state of who we are. That's encouraging, Ken. And, and I, I want to thank you for giving us such a deep dive into the study and, and answering um, all my questions. Much appreciated. Thank you. You'd be Pleasure. well.